Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us on this day about daily prayer, an ancient tradition in modern times. Today has very much grown out of an event a year ago when we also looked a little bit at daily prayer and concentrated more on the Psalms and how the Psalms might be used and also on the music. During the pandemic, I think the use of daily prayer by a number of people has grown considerably. Uh, Dean Robert Willis is going to share with us something of the experiences he's encountered um, live streaming morning prayer. Jeremy Law will share something with us about the history and the importance of daily prayer in the life of the church. James Newhook is going to talk about the daily prayer audio project which has certainly enriched saying daily prayer for a number of people. And Stephen Edmonds is going to share with us briefly uh, the experience the Prayer Book Society has had of a number of people trying to engage um, in daily prayer using the Book of Common Prayer. It looks as though it's going to be a very rich and a very varied day. And we're very grateful to all our speakers who have agreed to come along and share their thoughts and their experiences and their knowledge with us. Members of the committee will each host different parts of the day and you'll see me again a couple of times during the day before we finish. I'm going to hand over now to Rosemary who is going to start the day with prayer. We're going to use a, a selection from prayer during the day from the Church of England resources. If you would keep yourselves muted and join in with the words in bold. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Let your kindly spirit lead me on a level path. Psalm 133. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Behold how good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, even on Aaron's beard, running down the collar of his clothing. It is like the dew of Hermon, running down the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has promised his blessing, even life forevermore. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Grant to your people, good Lord, the spirit of unity, that they may dwell together in your love, and so bear to the world the ointment of your healing and the dew of your blessing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. A reading from John chapter 17. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me 
and have loved them even as you have loved me. Just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God kindle in us the fire of love. Amen. So now I would like to welcome uh, the very Reverend Dr. Robert Willis, Dean of Canterbury. Dean Robert was installed as Dean of Canterbury in July 2001. In 1992, he was appointed Dean of Hereford, where he served for nine years, having also served in Shrewsbury, Salisbury, Tisbury and Sherbourne previous to that. For 16 years, he's been Chairman of the Deans of England. Uh, Dean Robert is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, an Honorary Fellow of Canterbury Christchurch University, and for his work across the world in promoting understanding between nations, he was awarded the Cross of St. Augustine in 2012. Dean Robert is a key musician and known as a writer of lyrics, carols, hymns and verses. And it's a great pleasure to have you with us, Dean Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to just reflect a while on how we have worshipped daily here in Canterbury since the pandemic began. Uh, so I'm, I'm really going to tell a story with some reflections on the way through. Because we're still going daily in the same way, um, analysis, I think, is something that will come in a much more detailed way later when we've had time to reflect over maybe the next 12 months or so. But for the moment, it's, it's interesting for me to look back on what happened in March 2020. We certainly weren't expecting the, the, the kind of lockdown which suddenly came upon us. And I remember setting off for London on a train to a meeting on that Monday morning. I think it was probably Monday, the 15th or 16th of March. And thinking that I would be coming back to, uh, to Choral Evensong. And we just finished the restoration of the grand organ and our organist was ready, David Flood, to um, conduct a choral even song in the normal way, but it was a special one because the organ was fit to go and it had been a massive restoration. And then uh, at lunchtime, uh, as I was coming to catch the train from St Pancras back, I was told uh, it's, it's actually not going to happen. Everyone has, all worship has ceased in that way. And I got back to find that the choir had all been sent home. They bored next door, but they'd gone. And also that uh, worship was going to be very narrowly based. So for a few days from then on until the 25th, we worshipped as clergy virtually around the high altar. 
it all seemed very strange at the time, worshipping with no one there, but being able still to go into the cathedral. And then uh, on the 25th, the Archbishop and the Bishops of England wrote saying that churches must be closed and we follow suit and then began to be locked in at home which was a strange feeling but it's something you will all relate to and we all live on site here within the walls of the precincts of Canterbury Cathedral and we all believe and I certainly do that everything within the walls of the precinct actually forms Canterbury Cathedral because everyone there including our school which had of course of course had become empty um, is part of the cathedral community so that in a way the the big uh, uh, benedict would have called it the oratory which is the, the cathedral church which the creative community had built over the years is only one of the buildings it's the most respected building but it certainly doesn't form canterbury cathedral in my mind canterbury cathedral is the community gathered around the chair of the archbishop of canterbury saying its prayers together uh, day by day. So we came to the Feast of the Annunciation and I was here and uh, Fletcher was, was here as well. He'd come down from London having decided to spend the pandemic here and that he could do his work uh, on online, his property work online and would, would be here. I say that because you were only actually then allowed to connect with people who were actually living with you. You had to be a, a very small bubble indeed. So I had canons and archdeacons living next door and we had no contact with each other except by phone or virtually. And the, the building itself, um, heat was turned off and it was quite a cold March. It became a much warmer summer, but we didn't go in, we, we obeyed orders. But it was Fletcher who said, it seems impossible that the daily office which for 1400 years in one way or another had been said and joined in with here as the rhythm of the day and the balance of Benedictine life, body, mind and spirit in a community given to hospitality should cease because of this. Why don't we go into the garden and I'll bring a camera out and maybe if we could say the office then all righteousness will be fulfilled and the office would continue for the short time, yes, anyone's guess then, that this pandemic lasts. So um, the, the deanery garden is one and a half acres of, of very splendid garden with orchards and vegetable gardens and, and, and little runnels of water. And, and uh, so to go into the garden on that March day, I think we went into the front part of the garden so that the Tower of Bell Harry would be behind me. And um, I brought no pictures today, but anything I talk about, you can at any moment uh, um, simply type in Canterbury Cathedral, morning prayer, YouTube, and the date, and you will get it every day from March the 25th, right up to this morning, which we filmed earlier. So we thought at the time, this was something that I very much wanted to do because my life as a priest for uh, when well, I was ordained in 1972, but even before that in in uh, uh, theological college at, at Cunston, uh, and before that at home, the daily office had been the absolute bread and butter and bedrock of life. And so it, I was keen to do that and would have done it privately, but he was suggesting, why don't we just do it in the garden and maybe one or two of our congregation would like to join in. So out we went and looking, I sometimes look at that afternoon of March the 25th, I think it was the afternoon we started. And from then on, it centered itself mostly on morning prayer. In the beginning, we did both, but then the canons began to join in from their houses separately. Uh, and evening prayer was taken over from them after we'd gone for three or four weeks, I think. So looking at myself on that day, I'm thinking you had no idea what you had in store. And, and there I am rather nervously in front of the camera. I wasn't used to being suddenly thrown in front of a camera and in, in that way, very close up. There are the, the bushes of late March of the front garden and the trees behind me. 
and Bell Harry on quite a grey day. We read the lessons of the Annunciation and I used from the very beginning for morning prayer, um, daily worship and have found it all the way through this exercise to be a book rich with resources. Sometimes because I know them well, the Psalms of the Book of Common Prayer, if I'm quoting, come out uh, all sort of naturally. And, and I'll, I'll quote something like, if I go down into, if I go up to heaven, thou art there. If I go down into hell, thou art there also. It's, it's a different translation here in, in uh, um, daily prayer. It, it doesn't matter really because the rhythm of the, the thing is so, but my absolute bedrock is common worship daily prayer. We had been used to the choir singing every afternoon, the Psalms according to the Cranmerian sequence, so that uh, they would sing the section of the Book of Common Prayer Psalms, they still do, uh, uh, for that particular day of the month. So the natural thing always for us in the cathedral in the mornings, when we are in daily prayer, common worship, was to say, the other section, the morning section, so that each month our community would go through, said or sung, the whole Psalter. And day one would begin with Psalm 1, and you'd go one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight in the evening, the choir would sing, and, and off you would go the next day. And, and some of the, the, the days have flavor. The, the great thing about that for me is I don't even have to look at a lectionary. I know which Psalms there are after those years of ministry exactly set out for the day. And we began to do that uh, to help people see that the Psalter is a, a book of wonderful songs and hymns and poems and natural imagery and imagery of liturgy and imagery of the state, imagery of sadness, Im imagery of sorrow, imagery of tragedy, and at the same time, imagery of great rejoicing, individual and community and, and, and small family worship. And really, I think every human emotion is in there somewhere. So I was keen that we should have enough psalmody. And um, that's always been something I've treasured. So in the morning when we sit in the cathedral and the six of us who are clergy here, we have uh, me and the Archdeacon of Canterbury and the canon librarian, the canon treasurer, the, the canon missioner and the presenter. Uh, and we're joined by maybe eight or nine people on a Monday morning uh, to say matins at half past seven. And the sense of saying the Psalms together after the silence of early meditation ceases through the different seasons of the year was something that I was very keen to, to share. Also, the sense of seasons to me um, was very important in both as someone who loves hymnody and writes hymns, but at the same time, someone who loves the liturgical year but always when we've been right, putting hymn books together, I remember when we were creating common worship as a committee, there was an argument as to where should we start? Because uh, some hymn books, like the English hymnal, begin with Advent. Some hymn books, like Ancient and Modern, begin morning, which was right. <laughs> Were the, were the natural seasons and hours of the day the right ones, or the liturgical seasons, which followed which? Well, I think that, that what moved me also as well was the fact that when I was ministering in Tisbury, a Jesuit priest, who traditionally the Jesuits had served the village of Tisbury because the Arundels at Water Castle had a, a long Catholic history, and Father Tranmer, who was a colleague of mine for 10 years there, gave me a set of old breviaries. He said, you read Latin, have these, and, and it might be interesting for you to see how the breviary developed into your own Book of Common Prayer and into daily worship. But what was struck me straight away was that the breviary, it's no longer so, but the breviary then was in four volumes, and the volumes were not liturgical in terms of the church's year. They were autumn, winter, spring, summer. And that's rather lovely, having them on the shelves behind me here, that the seasons are made holy by the breviary 
and also, of course, they contain the liturgical seasons, but that is why they can no longer be autumn, winter, spring, summer, because that's a northern hemisphere thing. For in the northern hemisphere, of course, spring is the time of Easter, whereas in the southern hemisphere, autumn is the time of Easter. And so the thing becomes uh, uh, skewed. But it didn't prevent me thinking that our liturgy blesses the seasons. I'm saying all this because this began when we started filming in the garden and the seasons were unfolding. Remember, I said we started on March the 25th. And if you remember last year, it was the most glorious spring and summer. It was one of the lovely things being in England for that pandemic because we were treated to a perfect spring and a lovely summer. And people, as they saw the garden and began to tell one another, began to tune in. So the shape of the liturgy was anything that, that you might have done. What I am telling you this morning is, is absolutely not rocket science, nor did we try hard at anything. All we did was relax into the office and say a greeting, a welcome. And that became, first of all, welcome to those of you joining in. And then uh, a, a little bit later, perhaps welcome to those of you from the diocese joining in, welcome to those of you from um, England or the United Kingdom joining in. And then, then gradually, as you saw, because it began to go around the world online, you found people writing from the Philippines saying, uh, it's uh, sending an email saying, it, it, it's lovely to, to join in with morning prayer, thank you. Um, we have to do it the day after, because of course their morning had, had, had come and gone. But at that point, we were aware that maybe um, we were reaching two or 3,000. And remember, Martins on a Monday morning gets uh, eight people plus the six clergy. And the shape that we gave was the welcome, maybe because we we're English, something about what the weather was like, and also that was to help people because when they wrote in, many of them were locked down in places where there was no fresh air, no garden. Maybe they were in a tower block in a city, not necessarily London. It might have been Sydney or it might have been Auckland or, or really anywhere, uh, Delhi or, or, or Chennai. Or, and, and Jeremy Spurgeon is a, a daily watcher. of He's the chaplain at Madras Christian College, a daily watcher of, of morning prayer in the garden. Uh, and so one had to be very aware in the end that you were speaking for two and praying with many different nations and cultures. And after the welcome, we would say uh, our morning psalm. And I would use absolutely the psalm from daily prayer. And I, about 14 to 20 verses and, and reading them down and people began to get used to the rhythm of the psalms and the images used. Sometimes at the end of the psalm, I'd reflect on what the psalm said. And sometimes, because it's a, a favorite uh, um, piece of, 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 of advice, which my father used to give me, the more things you've got in your memory, the less you'll need books when you're in trouble. You won't suddenly have to be reaching for something to have to read. You've got it stocked up here. And I like to call that a sort of spiritual knapsack, kit bag. People across the world have said, we use it, the, the thing grab bag. Occasionally I'll say, this verse might well be something for your spiritual knapsack. Um, sometimes it's a whole prayer, uh, like the collect for this week in daily prayer and the Book of Common Prayer, O God, for as much as without you, we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Learn it by heart, I would say to them, uh, because you never know when you will be thrown back onto your need to create a little office by yourself in, in trouble. And I would say the same um, with poetry. I don't say the same with hymns, because hymns do it for you because of the music. So if you know the music of while shepherds watch their flocks by night, 
all seated on the ground. The angel of the Lord came down and glory shone around. You will know a good verse there in metrical form of Luke chapter two. And the hymns do that because of their music. But the Psalms, you need simply to just get it in mind. And so I've said that to folk all the way through. And people come back from across the world because they're not shy in coming back on email. And our biggest guilt is that we cannot reply to all the things that come. We reply to questions generally. And sometimes we reply to people who are in a measure of distress and, and want some kind of urgent care and that we try to do by telephone uh, rather than an, an email because you can then have a proper conversation but it's rare because the days go on but at that time all that we were doing in terms of worship together was online last summer there was no cathedral worship of any kind at all inside the building so after the psalm came the lessons for the day and we were um, we'd started before Easter, so we did a good Friday um, liturgy and on, online in the garden. And we also did an Easter liturgy. And then we were treated, and it was wonderful, really, that the lectionary did this for us. Just one lesson we've used. And at that time, the whole of the Gospel of St. Luke was read at morning prayer through the summer, and at the end of that, we would break for major saints days and break for Sundays. But the whole of the Gospel of St. Luke is a wonderfully pictorial gospel to be reading and is so good to be surrounded by the blue sky and green trees and flowers coming out in their seasons, but also to be looking at an olive tree or a fig tree or something of that kind. Um, and then after that came the reading right through of the Acts of the Apostles. So we felt that we were traveling along with Luke. And another thing that became apparent, and it became apparent to me in a very, very special way, there was a, a dean, I read the New Testament lesson every afternoon in the cathedral at, at Evensong and every morning in, in Matins and have done so, I, when was I made a dean? 1992, so nearly 30 years ago, that was Hereford. And for 10 years there and 20 years here, I've done that. But in the garden, somehow it caused you to, notice things differently because you were um, sharing that experience with other people so your mind was on them too and i was thinking how can i how can i make clear what what i believe after uh, almost 50 years of ministry and sharing with people what i believe about this passage that i'm reading what it's saying to me as i say not rocket science ordinary uh, Anglican and, and, and many other denominations form of ministry. We read the lesson and then for a while I'd simply talk about it. And it was Fletcher who, who uh, hit on the plan also to enrich it a bit of not only doing news but of taking dates, the same date this morning, October the 14th. Um, uh, what happened in other years on that date? And it caused people then not only to go back in a biblical memory, but also in a human memory right across the world. Now, this morning, for example, we have the uh, day on which Julius Nyeri died in 1999. And I had much to say of Thanksgiving about Julius Nyeri. I've, I've, I've loved um, ministering in Tanzania. And the sense of, of reverence and respect in which the Mwalimu, the teacher, Nairari, is held uh, is vastly important. But at the same time, the psalm this morning, Psalm 71, talks about, forsake me not, O Lord, when I am old and grey-headed. Uh, and um, he always liked to be called, not your excellency or anything else by his people, but simply Mze which is the Swahili word for respected elder person. Not for any particular quality, simply because there's a whole life in front of you. And, and so one could connect that with the psalm, because Psalm 71 takes you from, from you pulled me from my mother's womb, uh, and then forsake me not now, when I'm old and grey-headed, until I have told your message to the, the next generation, which is to come. So you then began to feed one way and another, and the other person this morning who uh, has an anniversary, an 81st birthday, is Sir Cliff Richard. 
And that too was a lovely thing to think about with people. But I, I was able to point out the fact, and, and you can put a link online and say, if you, if you Google this link, you can find Desert Island Discs for any character who's ever been on it. And Cliff Richard has been on it twice, in 1960. And at that time, uh, he was a very young man, just starting out, full of sort of hope, and we're all going on a summer holiday type of Cliff, Cliff, Cliff Richard, and The Young Ones, which was his other film, wasn't it? Uh, and Roy Plumley, that, that voice of Desert Island Discs in the, in, well, for about three decades, I think, interviews him. And then in 2020, December, uh, he's on it again. And he's now been through a whole life when he had to make a choice. He was baptized as an Anglican. He was born in India in Lucknow. But having been baptized as an Anglican, he just coasted along with that for a bit until he really embraced the fact that he wanted to be a Christian and then thought, maybe I should give up this career because it's easier to live a, a simple Christian life not being an international pop star. But everybody else said, no, stay there because the witness you can give to show people Jesus uh, is a, a really important one. But of course, the, the, the responsibility for that is, is, is a hard one. And also the, the things you have thrown at you are, are difficult ones. And you'll remember, and we remember well, because he was coming to give a concert in Canterbury Cathedral in 2014. And those allegations were made against him which and, and the shameful treatment of him by the police and BBC for which they had to pay immense uh, um, litigation problems. and and uh, that was all given to charity afterwards but he was justified but in his desert island discs in in uh, 2020 he talks about the pain of that never having gone away it will always be an inner part of his life and so it's a very different Cliff Richard in the 1960 Desert Island Discs from the one speaking still full of faith, even more full of faith, but taking you through all the experience of the Psalmist. So that doing the dates actually was a tremendous help. In, in this, uh, so today we had someone from Tanzania and someone who is both a British citizen and a Barbadian, because Cliff Richard is a Barbadian, but he also was born in India. And all of those things come together. So we do that day by day. And then at the end of that, we say um, the prayers for the Anglican communion and whatever diocese we're thinking of on that day, we say prayers for our own diocese and for Justin, our diocesan bishop, who's also Archbishop of Canterbury and, and, and the, di the, the, the parishes of uh, what we, uh, the, on our diocesan calendar, wherever they are in Kent. And then after that, say the Our Father in whatever language people like to use. Now, we're used to that here because when seminarians come from across the world for their four week course here and they're balanced through the nations, but we've not had any during the pandemic, of course, or newly consecrated bishops come uh, or when all the Lambeth fathers and mothers come as bishops uh, in July and August of, of next year, we tend to say the same say the Our Father in whatever language you like. And saying that makes, first of all, a complete babble of sound. It's rhythmic and musical, but it's a complete jumble of different sounds, which ends up with Amen, more or less at the same time. It is actually the most prayerful thing you can imagine in the crypt of Canterbury to have 30 seminarians in different languages saying Our Father who art in heaven. And then at the end of that, to come together in Amen. And we have to think about that now in a garden congregation, and I'll, I'll talk about how it's grown in a moment, um, across the world. And then I leave them two or three um, minutes of silence. And normally Fletcher will train the camera in different parts of the garden and then come back for a blessing. You see, nothing that we're doing is in any way thinking, oh, this is gimmicky, this is allowed, this is a new thing, that it's actually the Anglican office. And uh, people say, well, how do you do it day by day? Because we haven't missed a morning, either of us, since March the 25th of last year. And that means that uh, they have a, a, a sense of someone holding them in continuity. Not difficult for us, because we'd be saying the office anyway, 
and not difficult for us because during that pandemic, we couldn't go anywhere. We would need to be at home. But for people tuning in, they write in and say, and that doesn't seem odd to them at all, we love being at morning prayer. When we've washed the dishes after dinner in the evening, we sit down together and enjoy morning prayer. <laughs> Uh, and it, it, it actually couldn't matter less. I mean, people, people do that wherever they are. And they've also, there are people who say, I used, and I think of someone with a mother, that they, they, they themselves are in uh, um, Connecticut at, the, at New Haven, at the University of Yale, and their mother is in Adelaide. And uh, you, I got a thing saying, uh, thank you, because before I had nothing really to talk to my mother about. And now we talk about things that have happened in morning prayer. Now there's one aspect which I haven't mentioned and which became of course the most famous thing of all. And that was that on about the second Sunday evening we were doing things. It was the time when the bluebells were out in the orchard. Uh, and I was sitting at a wooden table and one of our cats, Leo, the gray cat, uh, the youngest of them all, and really the naughtiest of them all, jumped onto the table. And I looked at Fletcher to say, with my eyebrows, shall we stop? And, and he motioned, no, carry on. And this was Compline, which we did on Sunday nights at the beginning, uh, and lit a candle then for all who were, who were suffering from the pandemic or needing to be remembered. Um, and when I came to the end of the Our Father and said, Amen, Leo yawned. And at that point, people found that quite amusing. They, they didn't know what was coming at that point. But, but uh, about three or four weeks later, I was doing, uh, sitting in the orchard and we'd, we'd told the story of the beehives, of lifting the roof off the hive there in the orchard because we got four hives there and to get the honey and see what was going on. And that was an illustration to help people understand the people who in St. Luke's Gospel were breaking down into the roof to let their friend down in front of Jesus. And in the middle of that, I was sitting in the orchard and Leo had been around. He's dark grey, but can look quite black on the, on the, on the camera. And he'd run away uh, into the orchard and then decided he'd come back. And when he came back, and I was talking about the, the, the way in which the friends let Jesus down through the roof, he came straight in and um, with a serum cassock, you know, the flap is simply open at the front, just disappeared completely between my legs under the cassock and vanished. And I thought nothing of it, really. I'm so used to them running around and doing this and that, um, that I carried on. And then somebody rang up and said, do you know you've been made into a Facebook clip and it's going viral? And it did go viral right across the world and was, went on to Facebook and, and Twitter, and it was made into a TikTok song. He was on Have I Got News For You, and all of those things, simply because people wanted to smile at that time in the middle of the pandemic. And it seemed a sort of wonderful thing to them that this, this little cat had come in and, and vanished. And, uh, and I, I, I'm told that he was seen by a billion people across the world in the clip. And it was a clip which began with my words about the, 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 the men carrying their friend, breaking in in front of Jesus, and, and then Leo disappeared. Um, uh, and so it went on every news channel in the United States. It went across India. It went across China. It went across Australia and or everywhere. Uh, and at the end, he became a complete celebrity. But not to be outdone, our tabby cat then began to find that on the, the tray of tea that I put there simply because one wanted people to feel that ordinary things were going on. He jumped on and began behind my back to drink milk from the jug with his paw. And that became a, a signature tune for him. Well, he got a BAFTA and they even sent the gold mask for because again, the nation needed cheering up. But my favorite uh, um, message coming back from people about this was someone who wrote in and said, I, I tuned in to, for cat and stayed on for catechism. And that, that to me was something that we hadn't in any way forced, 
But at that point, uh, then we let the chickens out, and and um, we've begun to keep pigs as a sort of hobby in the in the uh, in the pandemic. And it was no problem to because uh, these cooney coonies follow you around like little dogs. And I found that people were so fascinated and surprised by aspects of nature of which they were completely ignorant that when you were talking about them in a way that was perfectly ordinary, they actually then began to make almost relationships with the extended family. And some people just living alone would write in and say, how is Winston, who was our, our, our male pig at that point? And when the piglets were born, then we decided we would put them on. But they were there always in the context of Thanksgiving for creation and the way that the seasons unfolded. And for that, I give thanks because I myself actually um, had the, the sense of learning things about the scriptures. And at the moment now, because we come round to a second year and I didn't want to go all the way through Luke again, I've done all four gospels now that we've now done Genesis and are on Exodus chapter five this morning with that same sequence of how things go forward. But now on YouTube alone, uh, 11 to 12,000 people will come to Monday morning matins. And then that adds to when it goes to Facebook, American Facebook. And what I'm saying about 11 to 12,000, that's only the, the shots on the screen. So most of those are watching with another. We, we would think that each broadcast reaches 40,000 people and sometimes even more. And I want to underline no rocket science here. It's actually what clergy of the Church of England and uh, ministers of other denominations and people in pastoral care have done always. And it's given me a new confidence of the way in which the daily office and a book like this is part of a backpack so that in it there are riches untold and people say that and they write in and say where can I get one of these and we tell them how and sometimes it's where do I find this translation I say well that's the book of common prayer that's that's a Coverdale translation of the psalm but you find it there so there's a hunger for understanding and I rejoice in that because it's been a, a really fruitful ministry for us it's kept a, a Benedictine rhythm of life going for us. Now we're twin track, so that we put out on the website cathedral worship, where the choir is now singing again and people are worshipping. But there are enough people across the world still for those numbers to be very high. There will come a time when, when it will be impossible day by day by day to keep this going. But for the moment, it is of no difficulty for us and the sense of being a, a worldwide congregation. And they've invented, it, it, was, it was sent to me on one occasion by uh, two different people on different days, calling themselves a garden congregation. And I happened to mention that on screen and, and that the idea took off. So now I'm getting people coming into the cathedral. I had a couple this morning when I was coming across from the office to do this Zoom and stopped me and said, um, we're members of your garden congregation. So I said, where are you from? And they said, hi, Wickham. Oftentimes they'll say Connecticut or Texas. We've had that quite a lot recently because individuals are beginning to come. And it's, it's a joy to feel that there is that connection through. And perhaps the one thing that I'll, I'll stop on now is that there was a day uh, about maybe a month ago when one of the, the dates in memory was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who had ruled a massive empire in Europe from Vienna all the way down and right across and across to the Spanish lands in, in uh, South America and uh, the other side onto the Pacific. And I said, he is probably the first emperor on whose empire it could be said that the sun never set. And then a, a message came back from a, a young German theologian who wrote and said, perhaps I might suggest that we are a, gong, a garden congregation of prayer, an empire of prayer on which day by day, the sun never sets. And it's a perfectly true thing that right across the world, people are tuning in to this most ordinary ministry, which seems to give rhythm and vision for life, both in finite terms here on earth, but also into a spiritual dimension beyond. I'm happy to answer questions about anything, really, and I'll do my best to answer. 
Thank you so much. Well, I don't think there's any way that we could have a, a better illustration of linking an ancient tradition with, with modern times. That was really fascinating. Thank you. In fact, I think people have been so caught up in listening to the story that they haven't want to have been distracted by typing out questions. So we don't actually have any on chat at the moment. But as you were talking, there's one here, if I could mention it to you. I wondered whether the sense of identity of the cathedral and its precincts is very important, just as it would be to a parish priest with their church um, as it's set in the community. Have you considered ever going outside into the city um, and sort of broadening the environment? Or do you think it's important to stay inside? I was just wondering. And let me let me answer that. We have we have gone out, um, and we do this early in the morning. Uh, we've not gone into the city because you get and and this isn't a complaint, but you get interrupted all the time. Mm -hmm. People will come up and talk to you, but but um, I mean I've been here in almost twenty one years, and so the minute you're out in the cities, people will will come. So we've gone out to on about two or three occasions to um, quiet places because we wanted to show people the extent of the, the bluebells in the woods in Kent. I remember going out at, at something like half past five and filming from six till seven. And it was a lovely thing for us to do. But in truth, we haven't even gone outside our garden walls because we've wanted to say this is something you can do at home. Uh, it is rarely that we go inside the house, but at Christmas time we did that. Or if I want to use the piano to illustrate something, I'll, I'll do that in the drawing room. Uh, and But largely speaking, we've been outside because people like to see the fresh air. And we've used the greenhouses too. And, um, Tomorrow, we're intending to use the greenhouse because at the moment, in the propagating house, we have a turkey with five little chicks who are really, really fascinating and attractive. And we've got a grey hen with eight very different little chicks who've only hatched yesterday. And uh, they're all running around. And Tiger, the cat who got the BAFTA, is there with them. He's the softest creature in all creation and would, wouldn't, wouldn't even hurt a fly, leave alone a chick. And he's frightened to death of the female turkey anyway. Um, and two tortoises and three pheasants. And I'm wanting tomorrow to use the idea of Moses with the, the, the multitude of the children of Israel, of all different tribes and things running around. And, around me will, will be this. And people get illustrations like that and they hook them on the mind so that if you're there and familiarity is everything as well, that they think, ah, yes, this morning you're there, but we've played tricks galore with that. And people love puzzles. Uh, and, and, and it's like why they like detective stories. I like detective stories and puzzles a great deal. But if you're, if you're giving them a sort of puzzle always, um, then uh, it's it's fun to do. And where are they this morning has become quite a trick. So we have kept back, we've got a most beautiful hand-drawn map of the deanery garden with little creatures drawn on it and the house drawn on it, but we've not let it out because we want people to be guessing where we are. Are we in the orchard or are we on the path under the mulberry tree or are we up on the bastion garden on the wall or in the vegetable garden? And you can trick people. I mean, obviously, when it's under snow and we went right through scenes that looked just like Narnia with a robin on a twig and, and, and singing in that way and explaining what kind of bird this was. Because an American robin looks very different from an English robin. Um, so all of those things. But if you trick people by taking a shot back to front, so that you're on the other side of the path and you're looking that way. People never seem to know where they are, but they enjoy the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And then when they come here and say, I'm one of the garden congregation and I've come from there, and I say, well, I've got half an hour. Do you want to come into the garden? Then there's quite a sort of, oh, and they'll say, oh, oh there's Darcy, who's our big male turkey. And they seem to know him as though he's one of their own family as he comes gobbling up to them and things of that sort. So we have stayed with that, which is utterly familiar mm -hmm. because we wanted 
most of all, the sense of wherever you are, but particularly in your secret place, as Jesus says on the Sermon of the Mount, when you withdraw, then the familiarity is the place that you can you can take refuge and say your prayers. And that's been a, a help. So I would say, no, we don't even go out into the precinct, not even beyond the garden gate normally, because yeah. we want to be this, this to be a, a place of prayer, just as we as a chapter go into the Jesus chapel always to say our morning prayer. There's a sort of, now we're in this place, we're going to say our prayers, but surprisingly different things can happen in it. Does that make sense? Sorry, that. Thank you. Yes, well, um, now we do have a few questions. Um, do you envisage that online followers may translate into people sharing together with the office in their own churches? Oh, that does happen. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. And some, some um, actually play the morning prayer in their prayer groups. We've had that quite a lot. St. Martin's in Houston, in Texas, started with the alto line of the choir writing and saying we're morning prayer garden congregation but we've now started a group where and they would then begin and they read the passage and and play the morning prayer and go on from there so that is happening in different places yeah thank you and um a practical question here how much time does it take each day to prepare for and record the office okay uh, so i'm a morning person always have been and you know, by 10 o'clock at night, I'm fast asleep in the chair. And so I set the alarm at about five o'clock, quarter to five. And I suppose I take maybe an, an hour and a quarter with a mug of tea uh, in, in, in the bedroom and totally alone, uh, except for maybe a cat on the bed. Um, but, uh, and I'll read the lesson and think what comes to mind and, and then sort it. A lot of the stuff you don't need to prepare for because you know what you're going to be reading and you know which book you're using um and then we go after i usually nowadays after i've said matins in the cathedral at half past seven because it's getting darker now in the morning we'll come out and it will take us probably the best part of an hour to to film that's all yeah. and then i forget about it then until the next day okay. and i don't i never decide where we're going fletcher does that mm -hmm. so he's he's the cameraman and the the, the, the scene setter and an, another couple of um, practicalities, being England, has the weather ever defeated you, uh, or almost, and also has the technology ever let you down? And yeah. how did you work around that? Both, both of those, yes. Uh, we've never been totally downed by the technology, but quite often we're late coming on, but people seem to understand that, it doesn't matter terribly. And then uh, at the same time, um, the the... Um, what was the, the other part of the question? Oh, had the weather defeated us? Uh, yes, sometimes, if, the, if it's absolutely pouring with rain. But I do have a large, clear umbrella through which lets the light through and can, can sit with it pouring down. Um, but if it's windy and wet, then we would probably go into the greenhouse. But it's not very often. Then. No. And we've certainly gone out in all kinds of ice and snow because you can wrap up against that. And it's not a problem. So we, we have one, uh, probably the final question here. Yeah. Um, how do you choose the chapters? As I notice uh, that you skip some parts of the Old Testament. Um, I've skipped, yeah, I have skipped bits of the book of Genesis, which I didn't think helped the story through. Right. So um, on the whole, I think I want people to see a story going through. And so we've just done the Joseph story. Largely, I don't skip chapters. I'm a great believer in consecutive reading, but it's the same kind of thing as any lectionary does, that, that you will come across either a, 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 a story which has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in it. And, and so you don't want people to lose the momentum of um, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph story, which takes you through Genesis. And now the, the Moses and Aaron story on the way through. And there are chapters, and why would there not be, with the, the length of time since those books were put together in, in, in uh, the, 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 the past, but sophisticated hands then stitch them together in that way. But I think the continuity of story in the mind of people who are tuning in daily, and you can also say, if you want to sort of go back to that, you can go back yesterday. 
So it's 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 in that way. But we we I, when we did the book of Revelation, I don't think we missed anything at all. We did the whole the whole lot through. And each day I would try and wrestle with it and, and say, well, what does that mean to me? Why is it important that the church reads this publicly? Because the consecutive reading of scripture has always been part, certainly of our Anglican Episcopal tradition, not I'm going to preach on my faith bit, you know, but what the lectionary gives. And Rowan Williams was absolutely firm about that always. If you said to him, this is a special service. Do you want special lessons? He would always say, no, no, what, what the scriptures give us, we, we take. And, and that's what we make our bread and, and give leaven to. And, and so I would say as far as possible, we don't try to skip chapters. In Psalms, sometimes, because some of the long Psalms, 68, which is a wonderful Psalm on, on, on the 13th morning of the month. Um, and uh, in that, I will say, it's a long psalm. We're going to read parts of it. And so that then makes a, a sequence through. But I think you're, the length of some of the psalms prohibits that. But I always say to them, you can read the whole psalm because so many of them have got the daily prayer because they've sent in, they send to my secretary constantly saying, where do I get it? So I should take a commission from Church House Publishing. <laughs> Thank you. Could I just ask you one very, very final brief? Um, obviously, having these thousands of people now tuning in is a huge responsibility. It is. Yes. If if it was ever to be decided that this this needn't carry on in pandemic terms, you know, it wasn't sort of necessary in that way. Would you still feel that really having built it up now, it, it needs to continue? Because I was thinking people in parishes might be asking that question they do ask constantly and and mostly in the terms of not sort of when you're finishing but we do hope this can continue well the answer is it really can't continue as it is because uh day by day by day this is very rare life for me to be in the same place every morning and so it's been seizing the moment and opportunity that Heaven has given us. It, truly, it's it's been a, a kairos. You know, the times have come together to be just just in that. Um, but I would say that the, if the cathedral gave up virtual ministry, and of all types, because some love tuning into Cora Evensong with the formality of that, but others would far rather have the informality, though there's still a formal structure of what we're doing in the garden. And if 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 you lost the opportunity to continue that. But I would say it couldn't go on every day. It, it would be something of that sort. But somebody also said, because I said at certain times of year, being the, the dean of the, the, the mother church of the communion, very often I've gone to places to give encouragement. In, in um, And uh, Jeremy and I were saying earlier, we're, we're at Chennai at, at some stage. And I remember going to St. George's Cathedral there. But in, in Washington, for example, where the Cathedral Church, the National Cathedral of the United States, is actually modelled on Canterbury, and going across there and, and just giving encouragement, preaching there. Um, if you go there and someone will say to you, I, I think Bishop Richard Llewellyn, who lives in the precinct, said, oh, well, you could do it from there. But in fact, it, that would be quite an imposition on what you were asking of them there and also to, to, to have that extra responsibility. So I fear... It's yes, there will come a time when we have to diminish this particular ministry, but we hope enough seed has been sown for that to. And, and when, when um, uh, the church warden of St. Thomas Fifth Avenue, who, who's a, a great friend, uh, Kenneth Cohen, uh, was in touch the other day. And he said, when you stop, I've got a plan. I'm going to go all the way back and do it all again, which of course you can easily because all you have to type in is, you know, Canterbury Cathedral morning prayer, YouTube, and go back to March the 25th, 2020, and go every day after that. But uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I certainly could not continue doing this forever and ever. Amen. But I have shown to myself, and I hope with you this morning, that old ways of ministry are massively um, uh, powerful if they're used with the modern technology has only ever been fetched with the camera we've never used anybody else and he didn't know how to operate most of the stuff and now he can put it online and do all sorts of magic things you need two people and that's it so thank you well thank you so much dean Robinson. it's been great fun to thank remember you for the time to be with us thank you very much <laughs> thank you. Um, uh,
So, so my privilege to introduce to you um, the Reverend Dr. Jeremy Law. So Jeremy was born in Wales and brought up in Dorset. After geology degree at Aberystwyth uh, and postgraduate research in geology at Leeds, Jeremy trained for ordination at Salisbury and Wales Theological College. Following a curacy at Wimborne Minster, Jeremy undertook doctoral research at Oxford University, examining the relationship between Christology and eschatology in the work of Eugen Moltmann. In 1994, he became Lazenby Chaplain at Exeter University, where he was also a part-time lecturer in theology before becoming Dean of Chapel at Canterbury Christ Church in 2003. He also tells me he's a keen cyclist and a bass player. So uh, we welcome you, Jeremy. And Jeremy's going to speak sort of on the history of how daily prayers come together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to, I'm going to try and share my screen. So it might be a slight hiatus. I think I should do it. Are you able to see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just turn it into a slideshow. There we go. So, yes, the origin and purpose of the daily offices. So just to begin with some preliminary remarks. Uh, first of all, I have to confess that I'm not a liturgist, um, but I have been, I put here quite proudly, and I realise with Dean Robert, this 37 years is a mere nothing, mere beginning, but I've at least been committed to praying the daily offices for 37 years. So I've got a bit of, a bit of experience I can use. Uh, my background is in systematic theology and philosophy, and I'm afraid that will show. And we are going to be looking at the history and origin of the daily office, but ultimately I'm hoping that history will be um, the servant to answering the question about the contemporary value uh, of the daily offices. Um, what I'm going to say is essentially in four parts. So there are two um, introductory sections, which um, I hope will be, you'll see the relevance of soon. And then we'll look at the origin uh, of the daily office. And then we'll come back to the question um, of its purpose. And I'm going to begin with a big um, theological idea, which will guide um, everything that follows. I should also say that these, these slides are a bit wordy, to be honest, but um, they're a help to me, um, but I left, I left them like this because I thought they then can kind of stand on their own um, as a resource. So that's, that's my excuse. <laughs> so here's the first of my four sections, uh, the Trinitarian shape of Christian experience. So um, if you were to ask me what salvation is all about, I think this is probably the simplest um, yet quite profound answer I could give. Uh, it's not my own, as you'll see, it comes from scripture, but salvation is being able to share in Jesus' relationship to the Father, enabled by the Spirit. And a neat reference which summarises that, it's from Galatians, and there's an almost, almost parallel passage from Paul in Romans. So this sense that the essence of salvation is somehow being able to stand where the Son stands in relationship to the Father through the Spirit. So the Spirit can enable us to also call out Abba, Father. This experience of being um, a child of God. And I love the part right at the end, that if we're a child, then we're also an heir. There's a sense that this, this participation in Jesus' relationship to the Father through the Spirit is going to take us somewhere. There's something more to be unfolded. Now, uh, for me, an absolute fundamental principle of theology um, is this that I put in bold. God saves the world by being God's self. Um, I kind of bookended it with Augustine in the fourth and fifth century and Karl Barth last century, but there are, there are others I could lead you through who said exactly the same thing. But it's an extremely powerful and helpful principle. 
if God saves the world by being who God always is, then we have something which is revelatory. If God changed what God was doing in order to save us, well, we'd know about the changed God of salvation, but we, we would be completely in the dark about who God was in eternity. So this, this principle is vital for, for revelation. And it means that salvation is the outworking, I put here, the immersion of God's life in the world. In other words, um, God has a Trinitarian pulsating life of love given and love received going on in eternity. God doesn't do something different for salvation. Rather, this life comes to participate and show up in our world, in our time. And that means to be saved is to be caught up in that dynamic pulsating rhythm of God's life, of giving and responding in love. That's what it means to be saved. And that, is it not, is at the heart of prayer. Prayer is about sharing in God's Trinitarian life. Remember, it's about standing where the Son does in relationship to the Father through the Spirit. That, that rhythm of life is going on the whole time in eternity. Um, and Rowan Williams talks very helpfully about prayer being a dropping into that rhythm. You're not starting something new when you begin an office. Mm. Um, you're dropping into mm. and participating in something going on eternally in the very heart of God. In prayer, we offer the whole of ourselves to the Father through the Son in the Spirit. So if that's true, if prayer is about being caught up into the eternal life of the Trinity, then already the distinction between ancient and modern uh, in your conference title begins to fall away, doesn't it? Because relative to the eternity of God, we in our generation and every past generation, we're contemporaries. They and we have participated in exactly the same eternal rhythm of God's life, which means that, of course, we can learn very much from past practice, and it's worth asking about the origin of the daily offices, but we don't need to be confined to the past because eternity outstrips any particular moment in time. Okay, so bear that in mind. We're going to come back to that idea. Here's my second bit. Uh, this is a picture very proud of. This is my Push Prima. This is a bicycle that my mother bought me when I was 14 in 1975. Uh, in those days, it was a five-speed bike, and it was not quite, but almost the bee's knees. I was very proud of it, riding it to school and back. Um, I rode it all the way up until I got 17, and started to learn to drive, and the poor bike got shoved in the back of the garage. But then when I was doing my doctoral work in Oxford, the bike came out again. Um, I upgraded it, so it's a now a 12-speed bicycle. Changed various bits, but I used it throughout my time in Oxford, and I used it for a bit afterwards, and that experience has made a cyclist of me permanently. So I've, I've cycled every... I mean, most days ever since. This poor bicycle got retired in my mid-30s. I got seduced by mountain bikes. And then on the occasion that this picture was taken, I got the bike out. All I had to do was pump up the tyres, uh, oil the chain, and I took it for a ride. And I expected to be transported straight back to my youth, or at least to the days in Oxford. And I found that the experience of riding the bike was completely different from what I'd expected and what I remembered. And it made me want to ask why. And the why is this next little section. So we only really know what reality is. We only know reality through the interpretation that we construct. Um, you and I have never left the darkness of our skulls in our brains. Um, so we've never, ever 
any of us experience the world directly. We are entirely dependent upon our brains making sense of the signals that come in uh, through our senses. So the only world we know is the world that our brain interprets for us. And how we choose to interpret the world changes the reality of the world. This is something I'm sure you know, but it's worth remembering that we have no access to, the, to an objective notion of colour or sound. I mean, colour is just a certain wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. Sound is a certain frequency of pressure wave. But our brains turn that into the experience of colour um, and of sound. But we have no access to what those things actually are. So the experience of riding my bicycle is very instructive, I think, because in every important material aspect, my bike was exactly the same. It's the same size, same shape, same gear ratio, same everything. But riding it, the reality of riding it was totally different. Why? Because everything else has changed. I've changed. And I think most importantly, the context in which I used it has changed. Um, now it's, um, it's, it's old fashioned and outdated in so many ways. The brakes are hopelessly ineffective. Uh, the range of gears is so different. So my whole way of interpreting the bicycle has shifted its reality. So what makes reality is not simply the material stuff or the raw experience but the way we make sense of it. So, sorry, this is, this is a slightly heavy slide, but um, it's just a summary really. Just concentrate on the bold text. There's no meaning without interpretation. Interpretation isn't something you add on to, to reality. Um, you only experience reality through interpretation. If you're really interested in that, then have a look at Charles Sanders' purse. Looks like Pierce, but pronounced Peirce, an American philosopher has a lot to say about that. And yet, um, it's not a case that every interpretation will do. If I try the frame of reference of aeroplane to interpret my bicycle, it gets me nowhere. Um, trying interpretations on things, things will talk back to you and tell you whether the interpretation makes sense or not. So there's a lovely spiral process. This is really obvious with people. When you first meet somebody, you, you have to go only by their appearance. And we can't help but form views about somebody. But then hopefully over time, you get to know them. And that what you now know conflicts with what you first thought. So you have to adjust your idea of who they are. And that process of adjusting goes on and on and on. I mean, think about somebody you've known for for years and years and years, you can still be surprised by them because that process of interpretation um, goes on. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just impose a false interpretation. There's a wonderful spiral process. So in philosophical terms, I'm a non-foundational realist. If I'm gonna wear a badge. Um, a, a good example of this shift is uh, the process by which space becomes place or making a house into a home where over time events, stories, occurrences change and shift and add layers of meaning um, and a sense of belonging to somewhere. That just shows you how important that interpretive process is. Um, and that process of meaning making is fundamental to the way we view ourselves, others, and the world around us, and uh, the being of God. Interpretation creates our reality. So, so far we've said prayer is dropping into the eternal rhythm of the Trinitarian God and sharing in God's life. And I've also suggested that you can't understand anything unless you engage in a process of interpretation. So those are our two pre preliminary parts of the puzzle. 
So on to the origin of the daily offices. Well, the story I'm going to tell you very briefly is in general outline I put here very clear, though it's disputed hotly in detail, but I'm hoping, I put for, fortunately, the outline will do uh, for today so we don't have to get into nitty gritty um, argument, arguments about exact historical process. So I want to tell you a broad story which is gonna lead us towards Cranmer and the Reformation and um, particularly the Anglican experience of, of using daily offices. Well, the fundamental idea and the, the ancient roots of a daily office, of course, lie in Jewish practice. So there was the morning and evening sacrifices, that rhythm in the Jerusalem temple. I've not put it here, but by the time of Jesus' own lifetime, a number of synagogues were also engaged in uh, daily prayer services of the word, we would call them. Following the destruction of the temple, a form of morning and evening prayer comes to take those places so that, so that daily dual rhythm of prayer is extremely important. Of course, there are Old Testament models we can draw upon, particularly about the timing of prayer. So prayer, speak of prayer in the morning, the early hours, the evening, the day and the night. And there are mentions of uh, threefold daily prayer uh, in Psalm 55 and also story of Daniel. Uh, Daniel retreats to his room to pray three times a day. The Qumran community, the, the um, Essenes, they are a, a, a contemporary uh, Jewish movement of Jesus, and in many ways, uh, in many speculative ways, there are lines drawn between Qumran and Jesus and John the Baptist. But we know from the rule uh, that the Essenes prayed uh, morning, noon, evening, and night. So there's another possible source of this, this, this daily rhythmic occurrence of prayer. Turning to explicitly Christian sources, very important is the Didache, uh, just means teaching um, from the first line, the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles or the nations by the 12 apostles. Um, it's a document, we don't know exactly when it was written. It could be late first, could be early second century. Um, it was known in antiquity, but lost until about the 1870s. And it's a document uh, which tells you about lots of things to do with Christian life um, and discipline. And it has a little chapter on daily prayer. All it says is that the Lord's Prayer is to be prayed three times a day, but doesn't give fixed timings. Let's move on to uh, Clement of Rome. So he's writing, let's guess, towards the uh, start of the second century. He writes this, God has ordered oblations and services to be accomplished and not by chance and in a disorderly fashion, but at set times and hours. So that's another interesting clue about the emergence of a, uh, a rhythm of Christian prayer uh, on a daily basis, but now perhaps with set times in the day. Clement of Alexandria, and a little bit later, Origen also in Alexandria, both refer to praying three times a day, but they seem to refer to slightly different patterns, although you, you, can, you can reconcile them, of course. But one talks about morning, midday, evening. One talks specifically about third, the sixth, and the ninth hour. Um, so that would be 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. And then if we move over to uh, Carthage, um, again in North Africa with Tertullian and Cyprian, they seem to have combined somehow those, those patterns. So you end up with an early morning, a third, sixth, ninth hour, and then uh, an evening time to pray. So we're beginning to see um, 
Christian rhythm of daily prayer, uh, multiplying across the day and taking on a notion of fixed times. Now, what we could do, I thought, which I found quite interesting, was to compare the rule of um, Benedict from the very early sixth century with um, the apostolic tradition. This used to be credited to um, Hippolytus, but uh, people are no longer very certain. The apostolic tradition is a composite document, lots of different authors. Again, we're not quite sure about the date, but let's say third or fourth century. So what I've done is put the offices of the rule of Benedict to uh, map to those in red with the apostolic tradition. And you get a very good correlation. So these are the classic eightfold offices. Um, and you can map what the apostolic tradition says pretty closely, but worth noting that only prime um, or the communal service of catechesis is, uh, is communal for the apostolic tradition. The, it seems to suggest that the other offices would be said uh, on your own, coming together for the communal service in the morning. Uh, whereas the, for the monastic rhythm, um, particularly for the, the early experiences of monasticism uh, in the Egyptian and Syrian desert, um, there's a, a communal pattern would be morning and evening um, with other prayers said uh, on your own in your cell. And those are the kind of biblical references which are used a kind of literal interpretation. So seven times a day uh, and at midnight I rise. So the midnight, the vigil service has to be added in to the seven to give you the eight. Now, you can't go very far in reading about daily offices without coming across a contrast which is made between the cathedral and the monastic pattern. Um, and the more I've read and... Uh, Speaking to you today prompted a bit more reading about this. Um, the more I realise that this pattern breaks down. So it's, um, it works much more as a kind of thought experiment um, as a, or as a way of mapping the kinds of tensions and possibilities in the daily office. But here is a little attempt to show um, what the differences might be. So monastic, we're thinking the ideal is probably um, an Egyptian monastic setting. Cathedral, the ideal is, a, is an urban, ecclesial, Christian community. And these are some of the differences of emphasis. I'm just gonna pull out a, just a, a few. Um, Starting from the bottom, actually, the, one of the most telltale indicators is the way the psalms are used. So the psalms can easily be you can easily be selected uh, and used uh, for particular occasions. That's traditionally the cathedral model, or the psalms can be said in numeric order over a period. If you're a very keen uh, monastic type, you say all the psalms in one day in order by memory. Um, and Dean Robert was referring to the Book of Common Prayer pattern, which interestingly is a monastic pattern it uses for the Psalter, which is the whole of the Psalter in order over a month. Um, typically, the monastic office is something which is independent of time. It's not about fixed moments, whereas the cathedral model is about particular fixed times. And the cathedral model tends to be about praise and intercession, um, looking outward to the world. The monastic um, type is about meditation on God's word and inner spiritual growth. But you can, you can take that and use that um, as you will. You've already seen a process by which we may have started with two or three prayers a day. We, we got up to eight. 
um, the medieval story is a story of increasing accretion of more and more ornate ways, complex rules about what you read, um, repetitions. And, and the, the primary place of the reading of scripture uh, gets obscured by the addition of, um, of hagiography and remembering the saints and um, local stories. All sorts of things get added in. And because the offices are said in Latin, they become largely the preserve of the religious and secular clergy, not really um, a lay occupation um, any longer. There were reforms to the breviary, um, which contains the canonical hours or the offices for each hour, notably attempted by the Franciscans at various points in time. Um, so it's not, not just that the Reformation suddenly comes in and says, this is all getting horribly complicated. There were earlier attempts to simplify the pattern and to make it easier uh, for the people of God to pray. But Cramner um, takes that to a whole new level uh, and wants to return in his uh, reforming of the offices to what he sees as an original focus on God's word. Here's a little quote, it's worth reading this, I think. It's from the Book of Common Prayer, a little section concerning the service of the church. The, for the ancient fathers so ordered the common prayers that all of the whole Bible, or the greatest part thereof, should be read over once every year, intending thereby that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers in the congregation, should, by often reading and meditation God's word, be stirred up to godliness in themselves and be more able to exhort others by wholesome doctrine and to confute them that were adversaries to the truth. And further, that the people, by the daily hearing of Holy Scripture read in the church, might continue profit more and more in the knowledge of God and be the more inflamed with the love of his true religion. So it's a nice statement of purpose and why it is he wants to construct offices which essentially are about the inhabiting of scripture. So he draws upon a number of sources, actually, but mainly the pattern of, of offices used in Salisbury Cathedral. And, and he scrunches them down. So he combines vigils, lords and prime or ex takes excerpts from them to form morning prayer, and Vespers and Compline get pushed together and simplified to produce evening prayer. But he's taking, there's a lovely um, sentence at the, at the start of um, the Daily Office SSF, which is what I tend to use, a kind of enigmatic statement which says, um, and you should hopefully be understandable now, that Cramner took the monastic office and so edited it as to produce a cathedral pattern. Uh, and that is exactly what he did. But Cramner introduces a threefold structure, which has been true of all Anglican offices ever since. A preparation to meet God in worship, a meditation on God's word, and then a shorter section of prayer and thanksgiving turning out to the world. Right, uh, you are two slides from the end. So we talked about prayer and the Trinity, we talked about interpretation, we've had a look at how the offices grew and then were simplified with the purpose of inhabiting God's word in the Anglican tradition. So what then, might we say, what is one answer at least to the purpose of the daily offices? Well, remember, the only reality we know is the reality that we interpret. So praying the offices draws us into God's story, hence the title of this little talk, into God's story of creation, reconciliation and redemption through the daily rhythmic meditation on scripture, that story is when we come to place ourselves within, it becomes the interpretive framework, the lens through which we view life.
And what we experience is what uh, Gadamer, a uh, very influential philosopher of last century, uh, spoke of as the merger of horizons, or, or two perspectives are brought together as we pray the offices. So there's the biblical world and the liturgical world, which I think is, is a world painted in bright colours. So it's confident, it speaks of God easily, if there were, as if there were no problem whatsoever in referring to God and knowing what God's doing and what God's up to and what God's purpose is. So that's one horizon perspective, but that's merged with, as we pray the office, with our everyday world. I think, perhaps this is just me, but my everyday world, I, I don't paint theologically with those bright colours so much as I paint in pastel shades of ambiguity and difference and moments of confidence and moments of doubt. But in, but in the saying of the daily offices, those two worlds are brought together. As it were, the, the, the bright colours of the biblical and liturgical world helps give strength to the pastel shades of my observation of God in my life and in the world. And I think it's true that we can't live in either world completely. So I put here, we can't live in the contemporary secular purview because Christ's gospel pulls us out of that, of that world. We no longer fit in the world that many of our contemporaries, at least in the West, share. But neither can we fully live in the biblical world, which is shaped by Iron Age assumptions, which cannot be fully ours. I put here a bit tongue in cheek, but what does the biblical world know of face masks, COVID, social distancing and, and vaccination, just to make the point. We have, to, we have to find a way in which those two worlds merge, can come together, can speak to each other, mutually criticise each other. And merger is possible because God's word, and this is where I began, doesn't actually simply take us into a, an Iron Angel, slightly more recent past. God's word speaks about the promises of the new creation, and it invites us into, because God does in history who God is in eternity, it invites us into the eternal rhythm of God. So that's why, that's why the, the world of the liturgy and the Bible outstrips our present experience. It's, the, it's a world in which we can immer immerse ourselves and find new meaning for our lives. So that threefold Anglican structure of the office could be thought of as A, a, a process by which we move from our world to immerse ourselves in God's story, a dwelling in God's story through the Psalms, Canticles, reading of scripture, and then a bringing of that story to bear on the needs of ourselves, others in the world through prayer and intercession, a moment when the two worlds of God's word and our experience merge. So the offices give us fresh spectacles with which to view the events of the day, and a new scale for measuring worth and value. Um, living in a university, I need to escape the notion that uh, my performance says everything about my value into, uh, into a, a notion of justification by faith, which um, pulls the rug from under that. And whether you're ancient or modern, if the office is about a journey of re-seeing yourself, others, the world and God, through praying the office, then that re-seeing is always relevant and always necessary and absolutely fundamental to the Christian life. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. My goodness. <laughs> uh, if anybody has got a question to ask Jeremy, please do write it in capital letters and I'll, I'll uh, try and get three or four questions to Jeremy um, this, in the rest of this time we've got allowed. Um, what I was going to ask you, Jeremy, is what, as I say the um, daily office, 
most mornings. What I'm mindful of what, as a priest is that you're praying on behalf of the parish and using the words on behalf of in a different sort of, so on behalf of, because people are busy doing about their, you know, they're busy doing their daily work. Uh, we're, we're set aside to do that, but also praying on behalf of, for praying for them. Um, I, I've always found that a, a really useful way of thinking about the daily office, but I love your example of this, the bicycle. I was thinking of the Anglican cycle of prayer as I was watching it, um, but, uh, but also that we all change. And so it, uh, as Dean Robert was saying, it, I don't think it would be right for us to go back to the 25th of March last year because we've changed. And so we wouldn't experience the daily prayer now as we did then on the 25th of March. Mm. Yeah, I think that I think that that notion of I mean, that's that's also how I think about it um, in the university where I minister. I almost feel as though, if I, you know, if I, when I've said my prayers within uh, on behalf of four as many prepositions as I can add. <laughs> I've done my job. And then the rest of it is a bonus, what they get from me. But I think that's about, for me, that's about taking, because it's not just yourself you're taking into God's story. You're, you're taking everything you know and all the people you relate to and the world you understand. So you're taking everything that, that you are and you're placing that within, or you're or replacing that within this framework um, of meaning, which tells you about where where might, might I find God in this? Mm. And also, you're offering to God those things that you've you've come with, um, uh, and all those people who said, you know, will you will you pray for me? You're you're bringing all of that with you, um, and you're re reminding yourself. Um, as I said, with Rowan Williams' phrase, that uh, that I'm okay in this in this moment, I'm making visible and conscious to myself what is always going on. So, so what I'm what I'm uh, experiencing here is, in some sense, encompassing everything, everywhere. This this is the story in which all other stories find their place yeah and I love the expression of dropping in you know prayer being dropping into something and and um if you imagine a pond and you drop a couple of drops in the ripples has an effect on the rest of the pond so uh, one would hope that uh, dropping into daily prayer the ripples of it has an effect on on the rest of the world hopefully <laughs> yeah yeah indeed yeah. yes yeah um, so the question has come up, it says, have you found ways to communicate the participatory value of the office to students for whom this stuff might go over their heads? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a very good, that's a very good question. And the answer is probably no, not really. <laughs> um, we, I mean, in a very, very modest way, uh, because, you know, being affected by uh, lockdown, we put our daily prayer on uh, on teams microsoft teams and had people some students and some staff drop in and we had uh, i mean nowhere near thousands but we had many more people participate through that format than ever did in person mm. um so we're now doing it in a hybrid way so we meet in person but we still do it via teams uh, which i like because that's live so we can ask somebody online to read and, and that can be heard in the chapel, um, but I find it's a it's it's a very min, it's a minority of students who get to get to understand it because it's the sort of thing you have to live with um, for some while before it makes any kind of sense. I mean, the first overwhelming because you know this is the book we use. The first overwhelming sense is well, I'm telling you where to put all these ribbons. Um, so just just the sheer mechanics of it get in the way until you say to people, I sometimes say, well, I imagine myself as a plank of wood on a beach and I need to refloat myself. And the, the kind of waves of the psalm, the canticle, the reading, they're like waves coming in, which lift me and move me a bit. And hopefully by the end of the office, I've ceased to be 
on the beach and I'm back in the water. So they, so you have to get people to get over the paying attention to absolutely every detail, to the sense of the deeper rhythm, yeah. but, but limited success, if I'm honest. Um, somebody's asked, the biblical world, as you define it, is now so alien to most people's consciousness. Do you think we need new language and metaphors to bring these together for re-seeing? Yeah, that, that's a, that is a very good point. Um, I, I mean, if in, in person, I sometimes like to explain very briefly what, what is going on uh, in scripture. Um, I mean, some bits, I mean, so, stories of, about Jesus, Jesus' parables, um, stories of healing, etc., are more accessible to folk. Some bits of Paul's language, I haven't got a clue, and some parts of the Old Testament, because they have got, they don't know where, where the story fits. So even, even um, a couple of sentences of context giving before you read the scripture, I think can be very, very helpful. You know, without turning it into a sermon, just saying where, you know, where does this belong? Uh, and, and kind of what's going on because I, I agree it, it, otherwise it's just um, it's just mystifying really yeah that is a that is an issue so Norman has said um, thank you for your idea of the officers sharing in God's story with their story might this approach help those who give up the office because they find it boring yeah well Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think, what do you see? I, I found The Office really boring too, yeah. especially when it was the alternative service book, <laughs> where the only excitement was the canticle changed according to the day. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very dry. I found it very hard. And the discovery of, um, of the you know, Society of St. Francis, which has now come to influence the common prayer, was a complete revelation because... Uh, you can, you have enough constancy for sense of rhythm, but but the ability to adjust and fine tune and change, um, mm -hmm. and even I mean I sometimes get rid of the Benedictus and use another canticle in that place, so I feel that, that, that it's needed to chivy things up. So I think there are different different resources and there are different ways. I found um, the Iona community extremely helpful, their offices, because of the, the kind of freshness of the language, Taizane or Thumbria community. Um, once I was prepared to give up the ASB and look elsewhere, it's, I think it's finding the right thing that speaks to you. But it is, it is something that takes practice, I think, before you stop, you stop seeing the words on the page and start to see through them, and that, that takes time. Yeah, I, I would, um, it's not a question, but I'd like to suggest that possibly in the same way that people like to experience um, cathedral sung evensong, they enter into the moment of it by actually plodding through the rhythm of daily prayer. You can enter into the moment, even if you don't understand what you're reading about, you're in yes. the moment. Anyway, Jeremy, thank you so much for for uh, being an academic, if you like, for the day. And uh, it was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I look forward to seeing your uh, references on the, the last sheet that's going to come up at the end of the day. So thank you very much indeed. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Welcome back to everyone. I hope you all had a good break and managed to have a good lunch. Having heard from Dean Robert how about how he continued the daily office during the pandemic, making it more accessible to a much wider congregation. And from Dr. Jeremy Law, something of the history of the daily office, we are now going to hear how the Church of England digital team sought to support the daily office through the daily prayer audio project. Through the use of modern technology, the tradition of the daily office has been able to be grown into a worldwide congregation. So to start with, Rachel Roberts, who is part of the Church of England digital team, is going to say a little bit about their work, which has developed over the time of the pandemic. And I will then introduce Jeremy, James Newhook, who is the audio producer on the digital team. 
at Church House. So Rachel, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, James just getting me a slide here. But um, my name is Rachel Roberts. I'm the Senior Digital Communications Manager. I'm here in the digital team at the Church of England. Um, this is a team that um, was actually only created back in 2016 um, with a recognition that um, digital tools and channels could play a really important part um, in everything the church does to bring people to faith and help people grow in their faith. And um, we began by um, going around the country, consulting churches about what they thought and what they needed and how we could help them um, in the digital space. And we also did a lot of research um, to work out who the people were um, in England who um, we like to uh, the, we'd like um, to hear our messages. So you can see some of some of um, the results of our research there. We try and make sure that we ourselves centrally are producing content that uh, would appeal to all of these groups, but that also we're supporting um, you um, in local churches if you want to use um, digital means um, to reach these people um, too. Um, so that includes people who might just be exploring faith, but also um, your regular churchgoers and um, the kind of people who might be um, engaging with churches through life events um, like weddings and baptisms. So from that point of um, research, we've now grown to a team of um, nine people, including myself and James. And um, we do a whole range of things. You're going to hear today um, about in detail about um, the, the daily prayer uh, work, of course. Um, but just to give you a sense of what else we've we've got going on and kind of what we're um, about we really we know how busy you are in um, local churches and we a lot of the things we do are trying um, to uh, help you with what you need to do um, so for example we run the website um, a church near you that you might have heard of that gives every um, church um, in the Church of England their own um, page their own website um, and we do a lot of activity from our national social media channels um, driving people to engage with their local worshipping community and to do that we say go and look on a church near you um, and find out um, which your church is and get in touch. Um, another example, um, well I guess the daily prayer is a great example of innovative tools we offer to encourage and support discipleship, so people who are already Christians but to engage and grow in their faith. Um, and um, we have especially in the pandemic changed a lot of what we do, pivoted a lot of what we do. Um, you might have heard about our um, weekly services that we started doing very quickly at the start of the pandemic. Um, so worship coming out um, every week. And um, we also, um, uh, the pandemic have really stepped up our offering of digital skills training for churches. So for churches who want to, do more digitally with websites, with social media, um, or just with running online services and hybrid services. We've, um, we normally trained about a thousand people in a year. In the last year, we trained, trained 7,000 people and that's all available um, for free um, to um, you and your communities if you um, are interested in that, a series of online resources and webinars. So that's a bit of a, just, I won't say much more because um, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what, um, of what we do. Um, but if anyone has any questions at the end about that, um, then uh, do um, raise those. And just to say that I'm really pleased that we got this opportunity to come and hear and talk to you about um, daily prayer, because I think it's a great example of how we've had the opportunity centrally to do something um, innovative and high quality. And that's resourcing um, people in your um, opportunity to resource people in your churches um, to you. So, um, yeah, I'll um, hand back um, now before um, James comes on. Thank you, Rachel, for those words. James Newark. James has been in his role as audio producer on the digital team since March 2020. He started in the role on the back of finishing a master's degree in music production, and he also has a bachelor's degree in film and TV production. Initially, he started at the Church of England working for Crockford's clerical directory in an administrative position, and his boss, Thomas Aileen Chapman, who is head of publishing at Church House, was also responsible for the various campaign acts, such as Follow the Star and Live Lent, and enlisted James to assist with the app audio. Once the in the audio 
producer's position, the first project he worked on was Time to Pray audio, and that is available in the Time to Pray app and podcast, which in turn led on to Daily Prayer audio project. So I will now hand over to James, who will tell us something about the Daily Prayer audio project. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking to you today about the uh, Daily Prayer audio project, which uh, we actually just call Daily Prayer. Um, so if I say Daily Prayer, I am referring to the, the audio project we do here. Um, so who am I? Uh, well, first of all, I do have more clothes. I happen to be wearing the same shirt in this photo, but I, I promise you I, I do have a, a larger wardrobe than this. Um, so I, as Hilary said, I'm the audio producer on the digital team. Uh, I also work very closely with Church House Publishing, um, who own a lot of, who, who kind of are in ownership of um, the Daily Prayer and Time to Pray apps. Uh, so I run the Daily Prayer and Time to Pray podcasts, and this involves uh, recording, editing, uh, that's the sort of technical uh, side of, of the, the podcast and the audio, um, but also a lot of the administrative uh, areas as well, such as distributing the podcast, uh, preparing scripts, organizing recording sessions, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, I imagine a lot of you might already know the answer to this question, but what is the Daily Prayer podcast? podcast. Um, so the Daily Prayer podcast features uh, daily services of morning and evening prayer every single day of the year, and it launched in March of this year. Uh, it's available as a podcast through pretty much any podcast provider or platform that you might use, um, but two of the main ones are Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, it's also embedded into the Daily Prayer app, which is available on iOS and Android and can be found on the Church of England's website as well. So why did we start the Daily Prayer podcast? Um, I'd say the biggest factor is that it had been in demand for a long time. Uh, Thomas uh, Alain Chapman, who is uh, head of Church House Publishing, um, he has, it's something he'd been wanting to do for a while on the back of lots of feedback from clergy and other people who um, really were, were sort of asking for audio versions of uh, morning and evening prayer. Um, so the first step in the project uh, actually started in around 2018. Um, and this was uh, Thy Kingdom Come, which uh, you may have heard of as well. Um, so that's 11 days of prayer between uh, Ascension Day and Pentecost. Um, and for this, uh, I'll, I'll, get into, I'll get into Thy Kingdom Come a bit later, but uh, the, I, there was an audio project for Thy Kingdom Come. This then led on to Time to Pray. And the kind of end goal of all of this was to produce audio for daily prayer. Um, so another reason for starting the podcast is to increase the accessibility of daily prayer, um, allowing people to join in in, in different and uh, new ways, and also improving the general experience of the, the app that already a lot of people were already using. Um, and one final point is that prayer does underpin everything that we do at the church. It's part of our vision and strategy. So this is, this is kind of a, an important part of that. Who is the audience uh, for daily prayer? So um, as probably a lot of you know, clergy are expected to say the daily office every day. Um, so this again is just a way of sort of helping with that and providing the resource for that. Um, and it's also for those who want to fit prayer into their daily schedule, but maybe don't have uh, the time or the sort of uh, commitment to, to be able to, to say it and perhaps want to listen to it on their way into work or in sort of any area they, they might be in. Um, it's also for those who can no longer attend or have difficulty attending church. Um, and it was, uh, it was a plan that had been coming for a while, but it was also in a way something reactive to lockdown. Um, so it was something we really wanted to get out to people during lockdown um, as a way to, um, to pray during that time. Um, and the final uh, final point here is that uh, we do have the Time to Pray app as well. And daily prayer is almost like the next step for that. So those people who are introduced to prayer through Time to Pray might want to take the next step onto daily prayer. So um, it started, as I said, uh, 
I, I said 2018 before, but the uh, initial trial for Thy King to Come was actually 2019. So uh, this was 11 days of morning prayer, prayer during the day, evening prayer and night prayer, uh, which was a lot of audio all in one go. Um, and so this was available through the Thy Kingdom Come uh, app, which, uh, which hosted all of this audio of all of those services. And of the response and feedback of this, Time to Pray was the next step. Uh, and this was because prayer during the day and night prayer, they come in between seven and 12 minutes per service. Uh, whereas morning prayer and evening prayer is often getting up to about 25 minutes. So it was a, it was a good um, sort of stepping stone onto daily prayer to see, can we do this? Does it work? Do people like it? Do people want more of it? Um, so it was kind of, yeah, that, that intermediate step between thy kingdom come and doing the full uh, year long daily prayer. Uh, it was originally planned to be, Time to Pray was originally uh, planned to be launched in um, around September 2020. Uh, but when it, uh, the first lockdown happened um, or was about to happen, we, we fast tracked the project. Uh, we were in Lambeth Palace recording just a couple of days before the lockdown um, happened, uh, as we really felt this was something that needed to come out now because we didn't know how long it was going to be before people could be back in churches and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and then again, Time to Pray happened and then we launched Daily Prayer earlier this year. Um, so as I said, the initial recording sessions for Time to Pray were in Lambeth uh, Palace Chapel. And uh, these were done by Archbishop Justin and Isabel Hamley, who at the time was the chaplain to the Archbishop. Um, and they alternated services. So uh, one day it was Justin leading prayer during the day, the next it was Isabel and the same for night prayer. Um, and this was enough material to get us through the beginning of um, ordinary time, uh, sorry, through to the beginning of ordinary time. So we started, uh, we started with Lent, then Passion Tide, Easter, um, and then it became, and then we had to, we reached this point where we didn't have any more audio. So we, we were, sort of thinking what we can do. Um, we, the plan originally had been to record in churches and chapels and spaces like that. Um, but due to the pandemic, we weren't able to access those. So we had to kind of think of how are we going to do this uh, in this new situation? Um, so we did consider asking clergy to record in, in their churches, um, but being unable to be there ourselves uh, meant it was a lot of work for them and also they might not have the skills um, to uh, to be able to both record and and lead the services at the same time it was asking quite a lot um, so we had a think and we thought well what if we record um, we record in a kind of um, studio style setting and we create the the church or the chapel virtually um, so the solution uh, was to set up our leaders with these pop-up vocal booths which are about the size of a changing room um, and basically what they do is they uh, as you can see in the picture here is um, Reverend Catherine Williams who leads all of our daily prayer services uh, and if you ever listen to Time to Pray she leads a few services on there as well and in this picture she is in one of these booths so it's a big sort of fabric booth that goes around you and it helps to block out sound um, and get a really focused studio uh, quality recording in an environment at home where perhaps that's not normally possible and what we actually found as a, a bonus from this is it gave us a lot of flexibility uh, in uh, how we composed the services because Catherine could record in her home in uh, at Tewkesbury. She's uh, she lives in Tewkesbury Abbey, so she could, could record there. Um, and then we could have someone on the other side of the country watch a video of her leading, and record the congregational parts along with her. And then afterwards, on our end, we would combine them all together, um, and then kind of put them in a space, which I'll I'll get onto uh, in a little while. Um, and it really gave us a lot of flexibility to include people from all over the country in the service um, and and sort of, yeah, get a, get a lot more from uh, less recording, if, if that makes sense. Um, because if you're just recording in a church, um, you're kind of stuck with that recording because all the it's, it's all in one uh, one audio file, so to speak. 
Um, there's also a lot of music in uh, Daily Prayer. I know you've been, uh, you mentioned this earlier today. Um, most of the music is recorded uh, by Dr. Andrew Iris at St. Martin's in the Field. And he um, also uh, employed a similar technique of recording singers over Zoom during the first lockdown, um, which uh, I do not envy him at all because uh, that's, that's very tricky to conduct music over a Zoom call. Uh, and then layer it all up afterwards to make it sound like it was recorded together. So as I mentioned, we kind of, um, we recorded all these people in their own places and then we kind of combined it together. Um, so each element of the service is recorded individually. So that might be the Psalm or the gospel canticle or the intercessions. And what this allows us to do is we, we edit all of these sections as their own kind of thing. And then we, uh, it allows us to take a modular pro approach to um, composing the services. Uh, so for example, if it's a saint's day and you need a particular canticle and a particular um, refrain to the gospel canticle and then the collect, it means that we can kind of just drop these into the service and it doesn't mean we have to record a whole entire new service just for um, saints, uh, a saint's day because during, um, during ordinary time, for example, the, uh, the opening prayer and the conclusion um, are always the same every day. So it just makes it um, a lot more efficient and means that we can get two services out every single day. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the main things we wanted was to give the impression that this was recorded in a church or a chapel. And um, in order to do that, we had to use uh, two things. The first was reverb um, to simulate the acoustics of a space like that. And the second was room noise, because if you're recording uh, in a space like that, it's not dead silent. There's going to be some ambience. Um, so uh, I'm just going to play you a couple of samples here. So there's a recording that is dry, so that's without any reverb. And then the second one is what it sounds like if you're listening to Daily Prayer, be it on the podcast or the app. So this is the first one. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You that by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands towards the sanctuary. So as you can hear, this recording is very kind of tight and dry and doesn't have the ambience you would probably like to hear if you were listening to this kind of service. Um, so then we apply this afterwards. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You that by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands towards the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made so hopefully Come bless the Lord all you that does give the effect that it's been recorded in a in a space that isn't a uh, little cloth booth inside of someone's living room um, at least that's the uh, the desired uh, outcome of that servants of the Lord come um, so once we've a whole service together it's been recorded edited all of the post-production has been done um, it runs through a, a checking process to make sure everything's right all the words are right um, that nothing's kind of overlapping with each other um, it goes to a, a distribution uh, distributor so technically uh, the daily prayer audio is actually a podcast um, so we use a podcast host which just allows us to um, first of all, host all the audio online. And then this can be distributed to Apple Podcasts and Spotify and lots of other uh, podcast hosts. And um, it's also embedded into the Daily Prayer app, which is actually where about 80% of our audience listen to um, the audio, uh, because I know that the Daily Prayer app had a lot of users uh, prior to the audio being integrated into it. So um, it was it was actually a really good way to get the word out about the audio because one day it just kind of poof and it appeared in the app um, and everyone was able to uh, to experience the audio. 
Um, so how do we measure the success of this project? Um, so Daily Prayer has been running now for uh, since March, so about uh, seven, eight months, and um, it's currently had over one and a quarter million downloads, which is how a podcast is measured. Um, and it averages around 60,000 downloads a week. Uh, and for example, yesterday we had over 6,000 unique listeners. So that's 6,000 individual people listening to the audio. Um, and in its lifetime, it's been accessed by around 320,000 people. And the audio does continue to grow. Um, we were quite surprised. We thought that uh, we thought that after summer, it, it tends to tended to drop down in summer just because people are on holiday and and anything like that. Um, but it actually has continued to pick up as I think more people discover the audio. Um, and we actually had our, our best Monday last month with over 10,000 downloads. Um, Mondays to, do typically seem to be the day that most people use it. Uh, it drops down a lot on Sunday, as I imagine most of the clergy listening are actually saying morning prayer at church. So um, that's of course to be expected. Um, Something else that shows us how well the, the, the project is doing is that we do regularly hear from quite a range of people who use the audio. Um, and I've got a few examples here, which is a, a reverend listening on her daily walk. Um, we heard from uh, someone who would, had set their 99 year old mother up with uh, the audio so that she could listen at home. Um, and we actually have quite a few people listening in Australia as well. Um, so it's it's great to see how far reaching um, the audio is. And when we passed the one million download mark uh, last month, we shared some stories on social media and through some press releases um, from some of the listeners and about how they use daily prayer. So the the graphics you see across the top are from one of our listeners, Rob. And uh, Rob. Uh, unfortunately, um, can't go to ch attend church anymore, um, but he really finds, uh, finds well, as he says himself, he, um, he finds it wonderful being able to uh, say, listen and say daily prayer um, at home uh, with effectively with someone else um, through the audio. Um, so what is the future for daily prayer? Um, the first thing is that we need to get through seasonal time. Uh, we're, we're just coming up to the end of ordinary time and uh, we've, we've done a huge recording session um, to get all of our seasonal time audio ready. Um, so we're currently putting all those services together for All Saints all the way through to Epiphany. Um, but after that, we are looking to upgrade the app. That's one of our sort of, that's on the top of our list. Um, the two images here, the one on the left, uh, you might recognize as the daily prayer app. And the one on the right is time to pray. Uh, we would really like to bring daily prayer to be more in line with the time to pray app. Uh, it has a lot more features and is, uh, it looks a bit nicer um, and is just more user friendly. Um, another thing we'd like to do is once we've closed the loop, on uh, the daily prayer audio, which by that I mean, once we get round to where we started again at the beginning of Lent, um, we will have a whole year's worth of audio that we can continue to use for years to come. There'll be a few changes here and there where maybe there's an extra week in a certain season or um, we want, might add some more music, but it basically means that once that's done, it allows us to build on it and uh, work on other prayer related projects uh, that we're, we're very excited about. Um, so that's the end of my presentation and I believe it's time for questions. Thank you all for, for listening and uh, yeah, back over to you, Hilary. Thank you very much indeed, James, for that. It's given us a really good insight into how it was developed and uh, how it might develop perhaps. Um, just uh, one question. Um, understanding from the slide, who was your perceived audience interested to know and who is your actual audience? Um, I think it's it's actually uh, the the perceived audience actually ended up being the the actual audience. We um, we definitely we already knew that lots of um, uh, clergy people used the app anyway. 
and uh, I'd say the vast majority of people we we do hear from are, are clergy who who use the audio. Um, but at the same time, there have been people. Uh, it is a lot of a lot of the people are those people who can no longer attend church, uh, whether that's sort of an ongoing thing or if that was due to the lockdown. Um, it, it really is quite a range of people, and I think that target audience we had at the beginning is is the audience that do use the audio. Thank you. It certainly has widened the um, congregation, obviously, <laughs> worldwide, and is a source of mission, presumably, as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's it's really wonderful how many people are using the app, um, something that's, that is is very ancient and, and a long-standing tradition, being able to bring it to, there's definitely an existing audience that are listening, but I also there is a new audience that are, are being able to follow it in a very um, dedicated and sort of structured manner, thanks to, to the audio. So yes, definitely. Someone sometimes uses Chris Keating's book, Work and Prayer, to help people who are struggling with how to connect with God again. How do you see that? Um, I'm not familiar with the uh, the, the book. Um, I definitely think that would be a, a question for for Thomas. Certainly, um, he's got a lot more sort of oversight of those those kinds of things. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I can't really give more of a more of an answer on that one. No. Okay, but I do think that. Um... You know, if people are looking for fresh ways to try and, you know, re-engage with patterns of prayer and so on, actually being able to listen to someone doing it with you is quite, it can make, it can help some people to want to, um, want to carry on. We have seen that in some of the feedback yeah, yeah. that we've received. Thank you. While recording all the various parts of the services, how easy was it for the participants who did the recording to feel that they were part of worshipping while recording it? Um, I think Catherine is a very good example because um, uh, if you listen to daily prayer, there's there's only really one member in the congregation, which is her son, Harry. Um, so they actually we have them set up so they record simultaneously. And I know that the fact that they're able to do it together um, really makes it feel like it is they are worshipping in that moment, as well as it being a recording intended to be sort of used in a in a different way and combined together. Um, so that's a, that's a particular example. And then I know a lot of our readers, um, for example, uh, Jeremy, who does a lot of readings, has said to me a few times, uh, he, he's, well, there's a few people that are often upset with me when I send them the very long Old Testament recordings, uh, readings to record. Um, and they, they're just, sometimes when they're pressed for time, they prefer some of the smaller New Testament ones. Um, but Jeremy has said on a few occasions that he's he's really enjoyed being able to sort of delve back into a lot of um, books in the Old Testament that he's he's not read for a while um, and sort of reconnect with those. So it's it's really great to see it. Yeah. See it um, be something separate for the readers um, themselves, as well as it being uh, serving a purpose of recordings. Thank you very much. The Reverend Catherine Williams has a wonderful voice, lively and musical, which all your listeners will certainly appreciate. How did you come to select her? Uh, so she actually used to work here at the NCIs. Uh, she used to work in the ministry division. Um, so she's uh, sort of an old, old connection um, to us. And uh, when we started Time to Pray and we were looking for more people to be involved, um she was just an, an ideal candidate because we knew her and we knew how well how how lovely her voice is and how well she delivers these things so it was uh it was it was lucky that we knew her um and it's, it's been great to have her involved in it this much and greatly appreciated by people i think and obviously the um st martin singers have helped a lot of parishes actually with the music which was very difficult in the early stages when it had to be digital. Yes. Yeah, so we've got, and we're still continuing to add weekly music on the A Church Near You resource hub. And we're excited that soon we're gonna be adding a new permanent collection of music for weddings, baptisms and funerals. A lot of it recorded by that fantastic 
um, St Martin's singers. And another fact you may not know, we also, the recording that we do through St Martin's that we arrange as a digital team, um, that we use it for lots of things. We use it for the, um, for the for time to pray and for daily prayer. We use it um, to uh, yeah, offer to local churches. And we also provide it to the Daily Hope prayer line that you might have heard of uh, for people who might not be connected digitally but listen, would like to listen in to a daily dose of, of, of prayer and hymns, we provide that there as well. It's worth knowing about for parishioners who prefer that way of engaging. Certainly the Daily Hope um, line has been very much appreciated by people who just haven't got access to a computer and particularly the older people who did miss very much not being able to go to church. So, and that will now have the singers on it as well. Yeah. You'd say. That's great. Is recorded. I'm sorry. I appreciate the desire to make the sound feel like it is a recorded in a real church, but I'm interested to know whether listeners with hearing impairment prefer recordings without or with verb reverb. Um, I'll be honest. That's not something we've really explored. Um, uh, all the feedback I have received generally has been that uh, very much uh, thanks to Catherine is how clearly um, she speaks that um, generally it's, it's, it's sort of well received on that regard. Um, but uh, it's, it's something I think we bear in mind. As I said, we, we're planning on doing quite a lot of updates to the daily prayer app, but that also involves um, taking feedback and thinking how, it might be um, we might improve accessibility and we might um, improve features generally to improve the use of the audio and the app. So actually, that's that's a good point. And I think I would, uh, I'll be looking into that. OK, thank you. Have you got um, other ideas beyond even daily prayer of what you might develop for the future? Um, definitely. Uh, I think one of them's quite under wraps at the moment. Um, I can't really say too much about it, just uh, it's the nature of some of these things. Um, we definitely are looking to do more uh, as much as this, the current method that I explained of recording remotely and um, in sections is, um, is, is really flexible and helps on the production side of things. We do want to do more um, live in church recordings um, and we might try to introduce those back into um, time to pray and daily prayer. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we also like to hear what people would like to see. So, um, you know, suggestions on a postcard uh, kind of situation. Um, but yeah, the, the one that I'm quite excited about, I'm afraid I can't really say anything about at the moment. But suffice to say, we're always trying to use the resources we have to be, to be innovative and creative and offer that back. So yeah, you will hear more exciting prayer based resource news from us in the in the year ahead. But also we with audio in general, um, we're using in quite a lot of different ways Like you might be aware of the it was mentioned the some of the campaigns we've done at Christmas time. So again, we've got a theme this year um, at the heart of Christmas, which is details about on our website, which offers a whole range of um, resources that um, churches can use, anyone can use. And that's gonna include a series of um, reflections during Advent and um, the days between Christmas. And you're doing the audio yes. for those as well? Yeah, so those are um, reflections by uh, Archbishop Stephen Cottrell and uh, Bishop Gooley as well, uh, Gooley Francis de Carney. Um, and those are kind of almost like a, they'll be almost a companion to daily prayer during that time because they're reflections based around um, uh, around Advent and uh, include the um, the collects from uh, daily prayer on each corresponding day. Um, how can we get how's the best way to give the feedback to you? Um, I think that's through if you go to the Church of England website and uh, there's a there's a contact form to contact the, the digital team or um, I mean, in, in this group, I'm ha very happy to give out if you want to take my email address at the end. I'm very happy for you to to send me an email directly with any suggestions you might have. Um, so is that uh, I could add, I could give that to you, Hilary, and you could add yes, that. We can certainly yeah. add that to it. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, does Rachel want to say any more about that side of it or not? About feedback? No. No. 
<laughs> yeah, quite happy to but yeah, we always want to we always want to hear um how think if things we provided are useful how they could be improved uh, absolutely obviously most of it is audio at the moment have you got any um prospect uh, ideas about extending this perhaps to more visual presentations um, well, the uh, the project I mentioned earlier is is an audio visual uh, one, so um, keep an eye out for that on uh, sort of newsletters and social platforms in the near future. Um, we do have the um, the weekly service that is uh, that is a, a video service each week, um, but again, we're we're very much open to suggestions, and video is something we're thinking about with daily prayer. Uh, we have had feedback from people who would who would actually like to put a face to the lot of the voices um, and see who they are they're worshiping with every day. So um, yeah, video is something where that's 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 definitely in our minds as well. Because yeah. nowadays people are much more used to seeing having visual parts, yes, presentations as well as just the um, audio ones, obviously. Rachel, would you want to say anything about um, the webinars or not? Well, yes, I always <laughs> love the chance to talk about these. Um, so, yeah, um, I manage a fantastic lady called Liz who offers a wide range of um, free webinars um, for anyone lay or ordained who's involved in a Church of England church. Um, she does every month she's doing ones about how to update your church's details on a church near you, which is really important as in the run up for Christmas is when we get the most traffic through that website, people looking for their local worshipping community to engage with. But she also does ones on dedicated social media platforms. And she's also published working with colleagues from across the Church of England, um, a guide to running hybrid services. Um, she ran one we're also she ran one recently about our Christmas resources and you can watch a recording of that um, so we'll provide the the link um, but um, for you to include at the end um, but there's a wealth of stuff out there that is available for free so if you haven't already had a look and you think it might be useful I would do encourage you to do that okay do you know how, roughly how many people would be accessing daily prayer uh, the, I don't yeah. know the um, the app numbers, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the figure I gave earlier was uh, yesterday we had over 6,000 unique listeners, which um, is, is not the, the most accurate figure. Um, podcasts, analytics are not, um, they're still very much in kind of an infancy stage, um, but it is a very good representation of how many individuals are actually accessing the audio so yeah around 6,000 um, on sort of Monday Monday through to Thursday is our, our highest day so yeah around 6,000 on those days and um, then it drops down a bit over the weekend so right and do you have any idea how many folk are accessing on their phones for instance uh, yes I uh, I don't know the exact figure i think i think it is a majority of people are using it um by either a phone or ipad um we do have a breakdown of those figures i might be able to i don't want to to go don't, don't worry too if you you've got, let us uh, I've got oh, them right here actually oh uh, right um <laughs> well it says 60 around seven just under 70 percent are using um well, actually, a bit more than that. It's it's about eighty percent are using um, their mobile uh, mobile device to access the um, to access the audio. So, the the majority. Oh right. Have you thought how to build isolated li listeners into a fellowship of prayer, building community in geographic areas? Um, using daily prayer. Uh, I'm not really sure. I think it's again, it's something good to think about um i think that perhaps that's that's a church near uh, kind of branches into a church near you or is that not really a... oh that might be amazing possibilities yes. there. <laughs> yeah possibly i think yeah i mean that's an exciting way it could it could develop if you could see who is who is joining in near you perhaps i don't know yeah because we have quite um we have a few communities based around our um, weekly online service who've kind of built their own communities uh, lots of people who who aren't in the UK or don't have a, 
uh, an Anglican church locally. Um, yeah, that's why we've seen, particularly seeing sort of community developing around the resources that we produce. So on our YouTube channel every week, we put out an online service and, you know, you can see the people who regularly watch that and chat to each other in the YouTube chat have set their own Facebook group up to engage outside that service and to keep in touch during the week. So that's quite an interesting thing to see. I mean, someone says a huge thank you for what we're doing um, with the DP audio. And it has actually transformed the saying of the daily office. Oh, well, thank you. And, and there's honestly, there's, there's lots of uh, so many people involved. Um, all of that. We wouldn't be able to do it without all of the, the leaders and readers around the country who often, uh, you know, have very, very busy schedules, but still manage to send me uh, uh, pages and pages of Old Testament uh, readings every week. So, yeah, thank you. But it is certainly something where you can connect with others. And uh, it sometimes can be quite lonely if you're in church on your own saying it. Yes. Now, I think it will be interesting to see how you manage to develop perhaps the um, visual part of it in the future. Yes. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Uh, we, we, we're kind of looking forward to this, this, um, this closing the loop uh, section because it does allow us to spend more time looking at how to improve the resource um, once we're kind of over that initial uh, year worth of audio. So, yeah. And keeping it going right through the liturgical year as well is yeah. so good, to be honest. But obviously, there's a lot of work in that um, to keep up with it. But um, obviously, you've learned a lot on, over the last 18 months, I imagine. Yeah, a bit of a crash course, especially at the beginning. Um, yeah, uh, trying to work out how how we carry it on um, without uh, without being able to get inside of churches and record was was uh, yeah, it was an interesting few months. Um, and for me as well, I um, I my background isn't in, in I I didn't have much of an idea about what composed a service of daily prayer. So um, wrapping my head around that was uh, definitely it was it was very interesting to learn all of it um but yeah it was a interesting first couple of months working on that so yeah i'm sure it was <laughs> yes um, in a time of economic stringency is it likely to carry on and is it seen as a priority because people feel that it should be yes i think um as i mentioned the the kind of the overarching vision and strategy of the church really is is underpinned by prayer um, and uh, it's the the success of this project really kind of just shows how how valuable it is. I I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, no, definitely carrying on. It is great. Do you know what percentage of users are clergy and how many are lay? Uh, yeah, that's that's not no. We don't actually. Um, it's. Yeah, because the systems that collect the data, they they don't collect the uh, they just say see how many downloads or how many engagements. We don't collect personal details of people um, using it. But that that would be fascinating. Maybe we mm -hmm. could get it anecdotally. Yes. Yeah. So you might be able to do it in the future if you have more complex technology, will you? Well, maybe the technology will advance. <laughs> yes. And then we will advance with it. Yes. <laughs> right. That's what we're about. <laughs> um, just going back now to another question. Will you be developing audio for night prayer, Compline, on the DP app? Um, so we currently have night prayer audio in time to pray. Um, we were actually having this discussion the other day that we would like, I, I know it's slightly different, the, um, the order of night prayer in the daily prayer app versus the time to pray app. Um, and we were talking about the possibility of when we do this kind of upgrade of the of the app itself to be able to include night prayer audio because it um yeah we, we were just saying it does it does seem a bit silly at the moment that you have you have the three you have uh morning evening and night prayer in the app but only morning and evening prayer currently have audio so it's it's something we are thinking about yeah okay thank you is there any chance of somehow working with care homes and residential homes where many people are truly isolated from worship these would, of course, mean working with the staff as well. Yeah, I think, um, again, something to definitely think about. And um, 
and yeah I, I wonder what we could do with with the audio to see if we can reach out to to that kind of um those kind of people and but certainly you know the audio is is publicly yes available and it's on the website as well you don't have to be engaged with it through the podcast it's possible for anyone to like if there's a in a lounge for residents you know a television with internet access you know it'd be possible to kind of send it out but um yeah I think there's also an opportunity for you know as local churches you could you could signpost that as well if there are any particular um uh you know care homes you're thinking of particularly locally in your area about that but yeah we can certainly yeah take that back and think about that in Mm -hmm. terms of a national initiative yeah I mean, I think probably it's a matter of making care homes aware of the resource, Mm. Um, perhaps advertising it more, do you think? Yeah, so so far we um, we honestly haven't done that much advertising for for daily prayer. Um, We kind of started it quite quietly. And then when it went into the app, it was just a case of um, it was a lot of word of mouth and the fact that lots of people already using the app. all of a sudden had the audio um but we haven't done that much advertising for it otherwise so it's that's again that's on our plan uh, of things to do so yes i think i think so perhaps it's down to us actually to make it known to the rest homes within our parishes to be honest and areas yeah please do yeah have you got any advertising material or anything for it um i think it's something we could uh look into yeah, producing. but also, you know, the, if, if you can provide the link to the place on the, our website where it explains about it and what it offers. Uh, but yeah, we don't have right now tailored text for a care home about they, how they could use it, but we've got the information about what it is and how to access it. It's on, it's on so the there should be some networks for care homes, really, which perhaps can be um, locked into. Mm. Mm-hmm. An online advertising material uh, again would be fine wouldn't it mm. yeah if you could produce some sort of thing for that I think with as far as the care homes are concerned probably that is the way to go but also have word of mouth from the local churches to be honest because most of them are in touch but haven't always got the resource to be able to go in and do it in person yeah is there anything else you would like to say about any of the um things that with the Church of England and the development? Uh, related to to daily prayer or? Well, the... related to digital, really. Digital. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I think it's great to have a chance to mention many, many things. I mean, I've the, the thing I really wanted a chance to mention, and I have, is, is, is of course, you're all preparing for Christmas. And um, we do at churchofengland.org forward slash Christmas. There's a whole range of things that may may help you if you're sending invitation cards out, if you want to talk on your social media about um, what you're offering at Christmas. Um, that's definitely we're very Christmas focused at the mm-hmm. moment in the digital yes. team, aren't we? Christmas <laughs> Christmas starts early for us, uh, <laughs> as I'm sure it does for you. Yeah. And also it's all, all Souls as well is coming up. Yeah, we yes. try and do campaigns um, around um, throughout um, the year, bringing together what, everything that's happening across the church so um for, at the moment we're on social media we've got things to do with um black history month going out we've also got um coming up resources um about if you're running services of remembering and then services of remembrance on um later in november and um, we'll have some content related to that um and um yeah climate related content if that's um, something you're, you're um your congregations are interested in we'll have around uh over the cop 26 conference so yeah we try and have an arc through the year of the things we're focusing on thank you very much indeed and can i say a big thank you to both of you and also for our audience for the questions they've sent in and for the way that you've also answered them and thank you for being with us today to show us what is available from the church of england in the digital team so thank you absolutely much indeed thank you thanks for having us And I'll now hand over to Norman to close the day. I'd like to say a really big thank you to all of our speakers who have made today so interesting and so varied. Um, We have journeyed from the early origins of the daily office 
to audio podcasts uh, with many other things in between. So a big thank you uh, to Dean Robert Willis, to Jeremy Law, Stephen Edmonds, James Newhook, and Rachel Roberts. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Um, our events would be absolutely meaningless without participants. So thank you for joining us. If you are watching over lunch, you will have seen an advertisement for our next event, which is on the 15th of March, and we hope in person at Holy Trinity Sloan Square. And it will be about liturgy for celebrations. This has been inspired by the fact that next year will be Her Majesty's Plat Platinum Jubilee. Uh, and a number of churches may want to put things on for that. But there are many, many celebrations that sometimes it's like, yes, how do we find the resources and put something together to celebrate this that we want to do in our locality uh, as well as in our nation? So Helen Bent and Rebecca Swansbury will be leading that day for us. Um, and we do hope to, that we can do it in person. If for any reason we can't, we will do it again by Zoom. After I have finished these remarks and after we have had evening prayer and we close down the screen, you will be asked to give us some feedback. Um, and as James and Rachel were saying, feedback is really important. Um, for those of us who put on events, we, we really do want to be hitting the spot and doing things which are useful. It's not a good use of our time or yours if we're not. So please do complete the brief feedback form on the screen. And that will help us as we review this event uh, and plan for our future events. And also at the very end, there will be a page posted which will give you links to future resources. Um, if you do um, uh, a snapshot of the screen on that, that will uh, enable you to have that in front of you, but it will be left there for a little while if you want to jot notes down. My final thing is to say a really big thank you to the members of the Praxis South team who have made today happen, um, to Anne, to Hilary, to Anna, and especially to Rosemary. And the four of them have made, worked really hard to pull this together. And thank you, all of you, very much. And a thank you once again to Christopher for hosting this and taking the time to make sure that the details are right so that this goes smoothly. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I will now say goodbye to you, but hang over to Anne, who will be leading us in evening prayer. Let's just take a moment of quiet before we begin our service of evening prayer on Thursday. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord. Oh Lord, make haste to help us. Blessed are you, Lord God, creator of day and night. To you be praise and glory forever. As darkness falls, you renew your premise, promise to reveal among us the light of your presence. By the light of Christ, your living word, dispel the darkness of our hearts, that we may walk as children of light and sing your praise throughout the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. Psalm 117. Alleluia. I praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you peoples. 
for grace is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Gracious God, we praise you for your faithfulness and pray that every nation may find your blessing in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to the end. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him who will genuinely concerned for your welfare. All of them are seeking their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy's worth, you know, how like a son with a father. He has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I will also come soon. Still, I think it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and co-worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for all of you and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, in order that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Welcome him, then, in the Lord, with all joy and honour such people, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for those services that you would not give me. I ask you to join in the bold letters. The Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. He has looked with favour on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent, sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel to remember his promise of mercy, the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. God, for as much as without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.